So my name is Sergey Sekalenka. I am the product manager for Cloud Dataflow, and I will be talking today about uh, Dataflow, doing a deep dive, and also talk about the roadmap for the service. Uh, I created a short survey. Uh, if you have time, uh, please fill it out. It's a product prioritization survey. Um, it has a bunch of features that we are considering. We might or might not build them. Uh, some of them, or actually many of them, are speculative. So there's no guarantee we're actually going to build them. But if you do have time, please fill it out. Uh, this feedback will be used for prioritizing our roadmap. So many customers uh, consider Dataflow a black box that connects uh, sources and sinks. Uh, and the majority of our, our users, our customers, don't really care what's underneath. But this is the uh, deep dive session. So we will be actually looking inside of the black box inside of the various uh, features and capabilities of Dataflow. Uh, the things that make Dataflow Dataflow uh, are all of the bullets here on the list. We're going to be talking about each of them individually, uh, and um, um, in aggregate, they comprise Dataflow and bring all, the, all of the managed benefits uh, of Dataflow. So let's start with uh, the first bullet, dynamic work rebalancing. How many of you know what it is? Just raise your hand. Okay, a few of you. Um, so let's start from the very, very beginning. Um, in distributed data processing, you tend to, uh, developers of distributed processing frameworks tend to divide work uh, inputs, data inputs, into shards. Uh, they are the basic blocks of uh, data processing. And then they create workers, data processing workers, and they assign this work to workers for processing. So in this diagram of, uh, it's basically a swim lane diagram where on the y-axis you have workers. I think I have eight of them here in the diagram. Um, on the x-axis I have time, uh, and each individual uh, green uh, box represents the processing time of a particular data shard. Now shards, the execution time of shards will differ. Why will it differ? It will differ because uh, you might have a shard for a particular key and just you have a distribution of elements for that key uh, being uh, uh, more frequent than the distribution for other keys. Or you might have an algorithm that uh, takes longer to process for a particular input than for other inputs. Very simple, I use the example of Fibonacci numbers. Do you know, who knows what Fibonacci numbers are? Right, so you have an input of a Fibonacci number, and it will take you, uh, depending on what inputs you submit, it can take you in you know, days to process or just seconds to process. Uh, here's a uh, uh, Gantt chart uh, of a real 400 worker pipeline, uh, processing a very simple pipeline consisting of three stages. The first stage is reading from files. Uh, the second stage is grouping. Uh, data elements in these files uh, by uh, key, and then writing out files to, let's say, GCR storage. And as you can see, the execution of this pipeline uh, is very, very uh, stage-specific. You have a read stage, you have then a synchronization point where you start doing grouping, and then you have the write stage. And the duration of the pipeline is pretty much the maximum of the first stage and the maximum of the last stage, the maximum of execution time of a worker. There's a lot of white space in this diagram. There's lots of uh, optimization opportunities. So that's, this is exactly what dynamic work rebalancing is. It's a optimization of data processing. Uh, we look at what we call stragglers. St stragglers are the uh, input shards, which take a uh, longer than average amount of time to process. Uh, and we cut them. Uh, we determine there's a uh, the, uh, uh, regular uh, schedule, we determine what the stragglers are. Uh, we cut them in, in half uh, and we reassign this work to workers which have uh, capacity to process more. And we do this repeatedly. So in this diagram, for example, you're looking again at this eight uh, worker uh, configuration. Uh, and what we do is we, uh, every X minutes, we, we check, we ask the workers, what do you think your shard will take to process? We, we ask for an estimation of processing time. It's an estimate. So the worker responds, I think my shard will take until you know, five minutes from now. And another worker tells us, oh, I think my shard will take six minutes to process. 
we calculate the average and then we tell you know all of you workers that um, have shards that will take longer to process than the average, uh, give up some of your work. Give us the work and we will reassign it to other workers. That's what uh, dynamic work rebalancing does. It uh, creates estimates for future work, it cuts work, it takes away work from workers and it reassigns the work to other workers. This is important for another feature of uh, Dataflow, which is auto-scaling. Uh, how many of you are using auto-scaling either for batch or streaming in your pipelines? Okay, it's a fair chunk, maybe up to 50% even. Um, without dynamic work rebalancing in batch mode, auto-scaling would not uh, be as efficient. Uh, let me give you an example. Let's say we start with a pipeline with three workers and we know that we have five input shards. So the green boxes there are the input shards, and we started our three swim lanes, so we have three workers doing work. And for about 10 minutes, we think, oh, everything is great. Workers tell us, uh, we think we can process the, all of the work within 10 minutes. Uh, and we think it's great. So we as Dataflow, Dataflow service. And then after uh, one of these synchronization points, uh, workers begin telling us, Oh, we know we were wrong. Uh, it will actually take us much longer to process these inputs. The initial values we read in the uh, input charts, they were not representative. Now we actually think, uh, looking at real data and looking at real processing execution time, now we think it will take us three days to process the, all of the inputs. Well, no one wants to wait for three days. And because we enabled auto-scaling, or the user enabled auto-scaling, the user is willing to... Um, uh, use more resources to cut the execution time. Unfortunately, without uh, the ability to dynamically reassign work, without cutting the work in, in smaller pieces and reassigning, auto-scaling would not work because you still have just five inputs. And these five inputs can be at most processed by five workers. So even if you set your maximum number of workers to 100, you know, nine, uh, what, 95, uh, 95 of them will be idle. Here's another real diagram that, uh, that shows how auto-scaling and dynamic work rebalancing really work together. Uh, this pipeline started with about uh, 100 workers and it will go up to 1,000. Um, and you, you see, hopefully you can see it, there are black lines here, they're not uh, entirely straight, but they just kind of represent partitioning points. These are the estimation points where we ask workers, give us some estimates for future work, for future execution time. And as you can see, um, uh, at most of these um, um, synchronization points, we decide, oh, there's more work available. Uh, the work is paralyzable. Let's create more workers. And we, we do that. Uh, you, you also see it here. We start creating more workers. Uh, and these workers get work assigned to them, and they begin processing. There's no white space here. Everything is very, very efficient. Uh, we don't use... Uh, unnecessary resources, your execution time actually uh, gets cut down uh, and you will use either as much or less resources in aggregate, uh, counted in core hours, uh, as you would have, for example, in a fixed uh, worker configuration without auto-scaling. Great, so we looked at dynamic work rebalancing and auto-scaling. Uh, let's talk about uh, state. Um, and I'll start with state and batch, and I'll also cover state and streaming. Uh, state and batch is represented through a feature we call Dataflow Shuffle. And to explain what Dataflow Shuffle is, uh, I need to explain what Shuffle is. Um, shuffle, oh, who of you knows what Shuffle is? Well, actually, a lot of, uh, many of you. I'll, I'll just repeat them. Um, Whenever you use uh, groupings or joins uh, in distributed data processing, you need to, what you typically do, uh, you as a distributed uh, processing framework, you need to collocate all, all of your key value pairs on the same worker uh, that is responsible for a particular key. And this process is called shuffling. Uh, you, get, you send lots of uh, data around, uh, the workers do that for you, uh, until they have the uh, key value pairs collocated on the same worker. Uh, we offer two options for shuffling in Dataflow. One is um, what we traditionally called appliance shuffle. We don't use the name externally that much because you know customers would ask what is appliance, and you would say uh, 
naming is not perfect, uh, but historically we called it appliance shuffle. So the appliance shuffle is your typical algorithm where you have workers with, with keys assigned to them and we do this uh, networking shuffle where all of the key value pairs get sent to a particular worker. Now this new technology or this new algorithm, data flow shuffle, uh, is something that we uh, borrowed or um, reused uh, from our BigQuery colleagues, um, which in turn are using a technology called MindMeld, MindMeld Shuffle. And MindMeld is an in-memory uh, shuffling engine. Uh, basically does all of the shuffling in memory. Uh, the architecture of Dataflow Shuffle allows us to scale to hundreds of terabytes uh, of data sets. Uh, we've seen customers doing 300, pushing, pushing more than uh, 300 terabytes, uh, and theoretically we could go to petabytes um, uh, in a single data set that can be shuffled uh, simultaneously in a pipeline. In Dataflow Shuffle, what is going on is you have your user code on the left-hand side still running on uh, virtual machines. Uh, and this uh, user code is connected through a very fast petabit uh, network with a backend service running in the Google Cloud we call Dataflow Shuffle. Uh, this backend service um, re represents itself to your user code through a very simple API. You, uh, you send data into it, you get data into it. And the, get the, uh, the data that you get is your grouped uh, key values. But internally, what uh, Dataflow Shuffle does is it uh, checks for capacity and availability in execution zones. So we integrate with uh, what is called a zone advisor uh, feature of GCE, Google Cloud, um, uh, Google Compute Engine. And then when, once we determined uh, which zone is best to, to execute your Shuffle job, uh, we will decide, the Shuffle proxy will decide, can we do the Shuffle in memory and if we can, we will do entirely in memory, and it will be very, very fast, and we'll send back you the results. Or do we need to offload some of the shuffling to disk? And so we'll do a combination of in memory and on disk. Uh, we have two distributed file systems. One is in memory, the other one is on disk. Uh, to you as a user, the benefit of Dataflow Shuffle is you actually don't have to know any of this. Uh, you change a pipeline uh, option, when you, want to, when, uh, when you want to use Dataflow Shuffle. Uh, in the future, actually, Dataflow Shuffle will be the default for shuffling. Um, and so all of your code is the same. You're, you're still writing your code group by keys and group by keys and combines. And, uh, but on the back end, we do this very efficient in-memory shuffling, allowing you to group and join very large data sets. How about streaming? So, so far we talked about batch. Uh, do we have the same problem in streaming? Yes, we do. Streaming pipelines also need to shuffle data. They also do joins and groupings. Uh, in addition to joins and groupings, in addition to shuffle, uh, streaming pipelines also store state. And the state is stored, um, and I'm going to talk slightly later about this, but uh, before I uh, explain where it's stored, uh, it's important to understand that your state of a streaming pipeline is divided, partitioned, again sharded into these um, um, rudimentary blocks of, uh, of data. Uh, they, are, they are sharded by key, partitioned by key. Uh, the keys we take from your group by statement, if you're using a group by, then we'll, we'll take it from uh, the key the, of, of the group by. Or if you're not using a group by, we, we're going to auto-generate the key. Um, in any case, your streaming data will be partitioned by key and it will be efficiently allocated among workers. So where do we store the state? Uh, the, stored, uh, the state today in uh, the, what we call the appliance uh, uh, streaming um, mechanism, it's actually called appliance windmill. Uh, I was trying to avoid using this name because again, we are not really using it externally, but our internal, since all of you are friends here, uh, this is how we call it, appliance windmill, or windmill appliance. So this state is um, stored on persistent disks, which are basically volumes of, uh, um, think of you know, a volume that you attach to a VM, virtual machine. And so we store the state on the VMs attached to your workers. And the key ranges are associated with particular volumes. 
For those of you who don't know how the autoscaling mechanism works in these cases, let me show you. So whenever we decide to autoscale a streaming pipeline that uses appliance windmill, we are actually going to reassign the persistent disks. So we'll take a persistent disk from one worker and we will assign it to another worker. And so now this other worker owns the data associated with the key, key range. Uh, and it's great, I mean, uh, volume reassignment uh, can be done pretty quickly, uh, but the problem with this approach uh, has always be been um, the, the unit of uh, autoscaling is this volume, we, we have to know how many volumes to create beforehand. Um, the granularity of uh, autoscaling is pretty coarse, meaning we, we have particular values we can assume in the pipeline, we'll basically be jumping from five workers to 10 workers to 15, then maybe to like seven and six. Um, so there's, there are big gaps in the values we can assume uh, of how many workers we operate. And so we developed a technology that is the equivalent of data flow shuffle, but in streaming. And we call it streaming engine. The streaming engine takes care of uh, shuffle, streaming shuffle, and it takes care of uh, st uh, storing Windows state. It's a backend service that runs in the Google Cloud. Uh, you don't have to change your uh, code in your streaming pipeline. Uh, it will work just the same. Uh, you will specify an option and that option tells us you want to use the streaming engine. That's all you need to do. And magically, your streaming pipeline will scale much better. Uh, you will use more, uh, sorry, you'll get more capacity on your user workers because now most of these streaming tasks, the shuffle and state storage, has been offloaded from the VMs where your user code is running. Uh, it's offloaded now to a backend service. Well, great, so we talked about uh, optimizations for auto-scaling, we talked about uh, optimizations for state storage. Uh, let's talk about, um, even more about auto-scaling and a few other things. Uh, a lot of customers are asking me, well, how do you auto-scale? What is auto-scaling? Uh, the simplest way of looking at auto-scaling is um, the outcomes that we are trying to optimize for. The outcomes include the system latency, which is uh, uh, the case in streaming, uh, or the execution time in batch, as well as simultaneously resource usage. So those are the outcomes we are trying to make better. We, we are trying to reduce resource usage, so it's always a minimization function, uh, and we are trying to keep the latency low uh, and execution time as fast as possible. The signals we are using to determine how many resources to create, and auto-scaling in, is in, in um, kind of a basic, basic definition is uh, uh, creating new resources, assigning them work, and then shutting down the resources if there is no work. So the signals we are using for, uh, for deciding when to create and destroy uh, user nodes, user uh, VM nodes, uh, is the backlog in the streaming case, how many unprocessed um, uh, messages we have. Uh, in the batch case, it's how many unprocessed work items we have, those shards that we continuously uh, evaluate and estimate and uh, cut and reassign. Uh, but we also look at CPU utilization, because we know if we only looked at backlog, uh, there would be um, one, one very illustrative example would be, imagine you have a pipeline that is hot keyed on a particular key, and so your backlog keeps growing, it becomes basically infinite, uh, because uh, all of your processing is actually happening on just a uh, single worker. And if we completely ignored the CPU utilization on that worker, we would be constantly creating new resources because our backlog is growing, right? So that's not a very smart strategy. Uh, we have to look at the backlog and we have to look at the CPU utilization or resource utilization of your workers. And there are other signals we're using. Um, in many cases, they're more like binary signals. Uh, is there paral enough parallelism? Uh, are we... Uh, do we have I.O. contention? Uh, and this all goes into this mix of decision uh, rules for auto-scaling. On the right-hand side here, you see a, um, the, um, a graph that we recently embedded in our job details page in Dataflow that shows you some of the outcomes on the top, system latency. 
And it also shows you a graph of auto-scaling. Now, this is a uh, perhaps not the best pipeline to show because it only has one worker. But, you know, in, in most re uh, real use cases, you'll actually see a uh, variation of the number of workers. Uh, that's one way of determining why your system latency and how your system latency correlated with the number of workers uh, used in the pipeline. In the future, though, we're actually going to give you more info about um, the outcomes and the signals. Uh, you'll have your system latency or your execution time, but you will also have CPU util, um, the backlog, and there are six or seven different metrics that we're actually going to show you in the single chart. Uh, this is actually the stuff that we use internally when customers ask for help, uh, and we, we looked at these charts and we determined, oh, it's very obvious. So at this point of time, uh, you had a contention, there was a hotkey, and uh, only one worker was doing work, uh, and we kind of scaled down your resources. Th this is why your latency increased. So we're just giving you all of the tools that we internally have to, to be able to better determine how to improve your pipeline. Uh, another way of uh, improving your pipeline, specifically for cost, uh, is FlexRS. Who of you have uh, heard of FlexRS? A few of you. Uh, how many of you are using FlexRS? Okay, not many. Um, we would like to change that. Um, it's, uh, it's a technology that allows you to save approximately 30% of your batch processing costs. The way we do it is by pooling together various types of resources. We pool preemptible VMs, we pool regular VMs, we'll probably in the future pool some other resource types. Uh, but to you, or let's say your user code, everything is the same. You don't have to change your code. Uh, the VMs represent them themselves in the same fashion. We do all of the management for you. Uh, we price the VMs at 40% uh, cheaper than regular batch, uh, batch VMs. Uh, but because we, uh, we require you to use Shuffle as the state storage mechanism, the overall savings will be around 30%. Now, the catch with FlexRS is uh, you're basically submitting a job into an execution queue. And this queue uh, will last up to, or will, will take up to six hours to pick up a job and initiate it. However, once you initiated the job, the execution time is within 5 to 10% of your non-FlexRS job, so it takes pretty much the same amount of time. The requirements, some kind of some of the bounding conditions for using FlexRS is um, we, will create, uh, we will enable auto-scaling by default and we'll enable shuffle by default. This is what allows us to achieve these cost savings and optimize the execution for you. Uh, I put down a uh, the uh, the parameter, the pipeline parameter, which, uh, which you can use to enable FlexRS. Um, if your goal is cost optimized, we will optimize the costs. Uh, FlexRS is currently in beta, and in beta there are two limitations. We have it only available in two regions, your central one and your past one, but we are going to add it to more regions in the future. Uh, and there are also only uh, two machine types available today. Uh, we're, we're probably going to add more in the future as well. Okay, so we are almost through the list of the benefits, and I promise there's a demo here. So uh, just be patient with me. Uh, the demo is in, coming is in, in three minutes. Uh, let's talk about how you can create jobs um, in Dataflow efficiently, quickly, and easily. And I'll start with templates. Uh, templates are a simple way to package your pipeline and share it with others. User survey, how many of you are using templates? Okay, a fair, a fair number, maybe 20%. Uh, the current version of templates um, can be thought of, um, you run your Maven or you, in Python, you create your, your uh, uh, Python pipeline, but instead of uh, executing the job, we will actually persist. By, uh, you have to specify a parameter when you, when you run the pipeline creation command. Um, the, the, uh, the parameter is template location. So if you have this parameter, we will, instead of running the job, we will create a file in GCS, uh, Google Cloud Storage, and this file is the binary representation of your pipeline. 
Now, once we have the, uh, this file, you can call it with uh, a REST API or through a command line uh, or through other means uh, and instantiate it, pass parameters to it, and create jobs. On the right-hand side, we have a list of the user interface for templates. Uh, we, have, we have about 25 predefined templates which do really, really useful uh, tasks. Um, they move data from PubSub to BigQuery, or from PubSub to PubSub, or from uh, Bigtable to uh, BigQuery. So lots of different combinations of ETL jobs. Uh, and this also demonstrates the purpose of templates. Templates can be thought of as simple tasks that many, uh, many of your users would want to do. Uh, and the only difference between the different jobs is the parameters that you pass to it. Now, future work, since this is a roadmap uh, presentation, uh, we are working on something we call dynamic templates. And the dynamic in the name refers to the fact that we will, uh, instead of creating a GCS file with the binary representation of your template, uh, we will create a container image with the user command that you, that you use to, uh, to create it. And this will allow us to, when you instantiate this template, it will allow us to create a sandbox, run your uh, Maven command, and create a job. Now, you, you might ask, well, how is it different from the previous version? Uh, it is different because now, with this new uh, approach, uh, we'll be able to convert pretty much any pipeline, any job, into a templated job. Uh, the V1 version, the current version, has limitations. Uh, limitations for parameter types. Uh, many things are not possible with the current version of templates. The future version will, will be, of course, much cooler. Lastly, you might have heard of this uh, SQL thing um, about a thousand times at the conference, right? And, um, and it's good because we are very excited about it. Uh, a lot of pe lots of people worked on it for uh, probably two years now, and uh, um, uh, we are proud to share it with uh, with all of you. It has lots of expansion capabilities, opportunities. Um, the Dataflow SQL um, feature is uh, is using uh, what is called uh, Zeta SQL, which is the the Google uh, dialect, which was open sourced, and it's shared between BigQuery and Spanner and now Dataflow. So there are lots of um, uh, standardization opportunities in the future for us. Uh, you write a SQL statement and it runs pretty much on uh, any Google product. Um, I'm going to do a demo of this uh, visual user experience that is integrated in BigQuery. Uh, and uh, it, also, it also is integrated with a metadata store. Uh, we call it Data Catalog. SQL is impossible, or running SQL on streams is impossible if you don't have schema for the stream. Um, you probably heard the, the, the word schemas uh, another thousand times at this, uh, at this event. So SQL and schemas go together, and I'll show you how and why. Demo. All right, so here's the setup. Uh, actually, I have a slide that explains the setup. <clears throat> I have a stream of transactions. They are sales transactions. You know, your typical stuff, the person who purchased the good, the good itself, the time of purchase, the place of purchase, and the sales amount. Simple enough. Um, what I want to do is I want to enrich the stream with some uh, lookups in a BigQuery table. So my metadata for lookups is stored in, stored in BigQuery, and it maps the, uh, the city of purchase to a sales region. Very often in um, companies, enterprises, you have a mapping of uh, geographies to sales regions. You have sales region managers, they, res they are responsible for particular sales areas, and so these managers always want to know, well, how, how much sales have I made uh, in the past 10 seconds? They're constantly checking their mobile phones and uh, monitoring how, many, how much sales they've made. So this is exactly what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to uh, do this enrichment query and join my stream uh, of PubSub messages with a BigQuery mapping table uh, to enrich it. And then I'm going to do an aggregation by, uh, by time, calculating sales statistics every five seconds here. Uh, that's exactly what this uh, SQL statement does. And now the demo. Um, how many of you are using BigQuery? Okay, 
a fairly large number of you. Uh, you will recognize this interface. This is the BigQuery UI. Uh, if you go to the More uh, menu and choose Query Settings and choose Cloud Dataflow, you will now have the opportunity to use your SQL statements and run them against the SQL backend. The UI is pretty much the same. Uh, the, the differences here are, uh, first off, we have a job history of jobs that we had just done for... Uh, of jobs that just ran on Cloud Dataflow. Uh, I'm lazy, I'm not as good as Pablo who, um, who did the live demo of SQL in the CLI. I would not, never be able to type the, the SQL commands as fast as he was. So I'm gonna use this uh, uh, repopulation command. Uh, I found my previously ran query and I put it back into the query editor. Um, this is the same statement I just showed you on the slides. It takes the pop substream uh, there's a little bit of a difference in how you reference uh, PubSub uh, topics and BigQuery tables. So you actually have to write PubSub or the system name uh, and then the object type, which is a topic in PubSub. Then you type your project ID and then you type the name of the topic. Okay? Very similarly in BigQuery, you, you reference BigQuery tables by saying, you know, it's BigQuery, it's a table, here's my project. Here's my, uh, here's my table name. Actually, this is my data set. Here's my table name. Uh, but then the, the join conditions are um, the same as you would do in, in regular SQL. Um, I'm using aliases. I'm uh, joining it by state. Um, let me show you the mapping table in BigQuery. It's in data set. Here's my mapping table. The mapping table contains uh, mappings between US states. For example, Missouri. Missouri is mapped to region one. And South Carolina is also region one. But then Indiana is actually also a region one. But then Delaware is region two. So that, that's how it works. Very simple mapping. Now you might, might ask uh, me, well, how do I, how do I look in my uh, pop subtopic? Uh, is there a way for me to look inside of the pop subtopic? Uh, we don't have a way for you yet to see the data in pub subtopics, uh, but you can assign schemas to pub subtopics, and at the very least, you can see the, the schema of a topic. Um, this is another thing that is different from the usual BigQuery um, UX, because you, we, we have a concept of uh, data flow sources. And uh, if you find it in your navigation tree and open it up, uh, you will be able to see the unique sources that are just available in Dataflow to query. Today, there are uh, pub subtopics. In the future, we'll add GCS file sets and, and other things. And so my, uh, my topic transactions um, has a schema attached to it. And this is the schema. It has a timestamp. Uh, it has some attributes. This, this is a standard field available in PubSub. It has a pay payload, and the payload is my sales transaction. The time of sale, the person who purchased the good, uh, the city and the state, and the product and the amount. Well, great, so enough of it. Uh, let me actually go and uh, run the job. Um, in, the, um, in the job parameter screen, I'm gonna, get, uh, I'm gonna be asked, uh, what is the destination table you want me to write? Uh, today we support BigQuery as destination, uh, that's our only destination type. In the future, we'll, uh, we'll add more types. Uh, let me just uh, type in a, a name. Sales stats 32. Yeah, and that's enough for me to, to start the job. Now, within a couple of seconds, I'm going to get a job ID. If I click on the job ID, um, the standard data flow job details page will come up. It will be empty because we are still creating the job, so we don't have the job graph. Uh, we are not yet executing it. Uh, it takes about it takes several minutes to start the job. Uh, so I pre-created uh, a streaming job using exactly the same query uh, just before the demo, uh, and this is what you would, you would see after a couple of minutes once uh, once the data flow uh, job is running. It has two boxes. The first one is run the query, and the second one is writing the output. Uh, it's live. As you can see, the, uh, the metrics and the counters are changing. Uh, data is being uh, written. 
Let me actually show you how uh, the Beam um, optimizer translated my query into a Beam graph. Uh, if you remember, I had two inputs, a pub sub topic and a BigQuery table. Well, one of them will be pub sub, and I never know which one. All right, so this is actually the BigQuery uh, input. Read input from BQ, uh, BQ rows. You know, slightly more involved. I'm not going to spend much time on it. Uh, let me show you also the, the pub sub uh, side of the SQL. Uh, reading from pub sub, parsing some data into row format. Great, so now, if you remember, I did a join. Here's my join. And the way we will implement this join will be by, uh, by doing a side input. So we'll take the stream of events in PubSub and we'll, um, we'll do a side input of all of the uh, lookup values from BigQuery. Uh, this is a very efficient way of uh, enriching the stream. And if you haven't forgotten, I have a uh, grouping and aggregation, a windowing operation there. Actually, I have a, uh, a windowing operation and a grouping by uh, the sales region. And uh, you will find it here as well. Here's my windowing. And then I have my, uh, my grouping operation, which contains of, um, uh, the, the, the time window as well as the sales region. Well, to prove that this query is actually running and producing results, the easiest, easiest way to prove uh, that it actually is working uh, is by querying the output table. Uh, the, the output table that was previously created by my, uh, my, by my demo job uh, is called sales stats 42 So let me run it. It's a simple select star. Just pay attention to <clears throat> the period start and the amounts over here because I'm going to rerun the query. All right, so it's changing. So it's real data flowing in. I'm doing my calculations by sales region. Uh, things are being created in BigQuery. So now you can imagine you have a business analyst or a user who wants to build dashboards. Uh, you can give the output table to that user and they can create uh, dashboards. They can query the table uh, directly in BigQuery. Uh, there are lots of different things they can do with this data. All right, so last but not least, uh, let me also mention streaming exactly once. This is an important concept in streaming. Um, data flow is, um, uh, and what, what it is basically is, um, we we guarantee we have guarantees for uh, execute or processing your data elements, uh, not more than once and exactly once. So the, we we have handling mechanisms for errors and retries, and we work together with PubSub to ensure that we have that we deliver messages and process them just once. Uh, to achieve exactly once, you would uh, most probably use uh, uh, a attribute of, uh, of the PubSub I.O. with ID attribute, you have to specify the ID. Uh, and internally what we use inside of uh, our implementation for, um, uh, for exactly once, we use uh, concepts such as uh, Bloom filters. How many of you have heard of Bloom filters? Oh my goodness, I don't have to then spend any time on it. Um, it's just a very efficient uh, way to, uh, to validate and check if we already processed a particular data element based by ID. And so this is it for my um, deep dive portion of the, uh, of the session. Uh, I have only a couple of minutes left. Let me talk about the roadmap. Uh, we tend to think of our future investments or future developments in five big areas. Uh, everyone wants to be, and as included, we want to be enterprise class and trusted. Uh, but we're also building features that support this uh, ambition. Um, no one wants to be using a difficult to use tool. So ease of use is also very important. And the UI, for example, you just saw the Dataflow UI and improvements in uh, schemas and cutting, cutting down on the boilerplate, uh, all of the investments in, in that space. Uh, providing you with uh, streaming analytics capabilities and remaining open and supporting hybrid scenarios. Uh, the, the summary of the features we are building uh, that, that kind of fit into each of the uh, buckets include uh, snapshots for streaming. Uh, the, the next feature is not necessarily data flow, but it's something that many of our streaming users want, 
uh, it's the message ordering in PubSub. So this is also coming up. Uh, we are um, beginning the work on vertical auto scaling, uh, which is um, a way for us to <clears throat> automatically adjust the machine types, or the, at the very least adjust the amount of memory associated with a single CPU, and doing it dynamically. So not, not at the beginning of the pipeline, but uh, constantly evaluating what this uh, right ratio should be. <clears throat> and then integrating with customer managed encryption keys, uh, releasing SQL support in GA, and uh, completing our work on Python 3, uh, releasing Python streaming in GA, <clears throat> and making the uh, uh, pipeline development experience <clears throat> significantly more easier. Please don't forget, fill out the survey uh, if you have a little bit of time. Uh, I guarantee you we will use it for feature prioritization. I um, think I'm out of time, but I would be happy to answer questions afterwards. Thank you. I guess no one is kicking us out, so if you guys have questions, we'll just wait until... Go ahead, maybe one. You mentioned, or I saw a bullet on the slide that you jumped over. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, switch. Oh, sorry. I noticed on the slide um, it mentioned interactive beam integration with <coughs> notebooks. <coughs> mm -hmm. So, you know, currently uh, you run the command and the demo requires that you already have it running because it takes, you know, five minutes to spin up or, mm -hmm. or a couple of mm -hmm. minutes. Mm -hmm. um, but ob obviously, you know, the ideal situation is where a data scientist is able to write SQL and iterate mm -hmm. and, you know, so yep. I guess, can you speak about the vision for that? Yeah, um, so the interactive integration with notebooks uh, is, is slightly different um, uh, capability than, uh, than the demo that I was doing. Uh, we actually want to increase the interactivity of SQL as well, so cut down this um, delay. Uh, interactive beam, though, refers to, uh, to the fact that we integrate with Jupyter-style notebooks. Uh, and allow you to write uh, Python code, SQL code, and just interact with uh, Beam running inside of um, uh, a Jupyter uh, notebook. So that's a yet another way for us to simplify uh, data flow usage. Maybe one more question, and then we can split up. Yeah, actually, I think you were first. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is about the new dynamic uh, templating environment. Mm -hmm. So how much ca uh, freedom can we as a user expect in the container environment? Or is that restrained to just the pipeline options? Well, uh, I'm told that um, this containerization of, of templates uh, will pretty much allow you to do everything you do today with uh, data flow jobs, regular data flow jobs, but now with templates. I actually, I'm not aware of any limitations uh, in, the, in this new dynamic templates world. I'm sure there will be some, but you know, no one tells me. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yep. And one more. Um, so, in terms of Python SDK um, and the IOs like implementations mm -hmm. versus like waiting for the you know translatable capabilities. Cross language. Yeah. Yeah, and like, how do you see it going on, like in terms of time, and also um, regarding streaming Python as a GA mm -hmm. rough estimation of like. GA. Yep. Um, I'll, I'll start with the second question. So the question was, uh, when do we expect to uh, GA Python streaming? Uh, very, very soon. Um, and I'll stop there. Uh, but it, it is coming. Um, for the first uh, question about uh, I.O. for Python, uh, we're going to do a few more native I.O.s. Uh, several are in the works uh, and planned. Uh, but the, the overall strategy for uh, uh, filling the gap, the entire gap between Java and Python is cross-language. So I think cross-language will kind of become definitely real in a year or so, maybe slightly sooner. Uh, and at that time, all of your Java IOs will be uh, available to, to Python. Uh, before that time, we'll, we'll do a few more native. Uh, I would be happy to take your questions after the presentation. I'll be somewhere in the corner or maybe outside. Uh, I want to make sure that the next speaker has time. Okay, thank you. <laughs>